It's James Finlay. I am Senior Elder of Cullen and Deskford Parish Church. And I love showing visitors around this gem of a building, Cullen Al Kirk. Today you are being treated to a bird's eye view of the Al Kirk, courtesy of John Smith of Portnocky, who was operating his drone, equipped with a suitable camera. The first question I am often asked as I begin to show visitors around the church is, why is the church so far from the town of Cullen, which is almost three quarters of a mile distant? The answer, of course, is that the town of Cullen used to be right here with Alkirk at its centre. All that remains of the old town of Cullen are the site of the church, the graveyard and the market cross, which now stands in the square of the new town of Cullen. Old Cullen was virtually a one street town with its street running roughly 400 yards in the direction of the lint mill to the south and 400 yards towards the castle hill to the north. It was the Earl of Seafield who caused the old town of Cullen to be demolished and its inhabitants moved to the new town in the period 1820 to 1830. Why did he do this? He simply wanted privacy and the opportunity to create an estate worthy of his standing. You must remember, he was one of the richest landowners in Scotland and his magnificent home, Cullen House, was simply too near a shabby old town. He planned to build a new church in the square of present-day Cullen, but the populace did not want a new church. They insisted that they be allowed to worship in their own church. After all, this was where their forebears, forebears had worshipped. The graveyard was th where their folks had been buried, and they, in turn, planned to be buried there too. So the new church in the square of present-day Cullen was never built, although plans for it can still be seen today. The laird undertook to effect all necessary repairs in the old kirk and he acceded to the people's demands to continue worshipping in their old kirk. For worship has been going on here for well nigh 800 years. Records tell us that there was a church or chapel here in 1236. This is one of the few remaining pre-Reformation churches in Scotland, still in regular use. There are still services held here every Sunday morning, except the first Sunday of the month when we worship in the Hall Church in the present-day town of Cullen. Until the Reformation in the 16th century, this was a Roman Catholic church, as most Scottish churches were. This was known as St Mary's Church in the Roman Catholic times. You probably know that Mary is the patron saint of Cullen. Look at the
Look at the top of this gable. You could see a triangular canopy below which would have stood a statue of the Virgin Mary, which would have been removed and no doubt destroyed by the reformers. The church is now a Protestant church, owned by the Church of Scotland and maintained and run by the minister, the session and the congregation. The graveyard is owned and maintained by the Murray Council as is the wall around it. The graveyard was closed for burials about 150 years ago. There is a more recent addition to the graveyard, to the graveyard, which I now want to show you. This area is very recent. It was formed by Lord Seafield in the 1970s. It houses just one grave, that of Lord Seafield's mother, Countess Nina. She had always expressed a wish that on her death she should be buried in a rose garden near the front of her home in Cullen House. She died in 1969. It came to be that a few years later Cullen House had to be sold to pay death duties. 
no one wanted to buy a house with a grave near their front door. So Lord Seafield created this little area for her. Her body was disinterred and reburied here. We are told that her dogs, which she loved and had predeceased her, were also disinterred and buried here with her. Here is also a memorial to her father, who was a soldier in the Great War, a captain in the Cameron Highlanders, and killed in Belgium in 1915. Someone from the British Legion told me something just a year ago that I hadn't thought about. He suggested that that was the original wooden cross with the appropriate aluminium strips giving it name, rank, army number, regiment and date of death that would have marked his grave in Belgium. It is now protected with a plastic cover. His grave, no doubt, would now be marked by one of those white Portland stone gravestones. There are far too many of them in Flanders fields. I want to show you a couple of gravestones. This one is in memory of a family of Frasers. It shows how members of one family died all over the world. Australia, America, West Indies, Burma and India. It shows how one family from this small town of Cullen went all over the world, bringing with them British values, British culture, British influence. Remember the maps on our classroom walls with areas of red marking those territories that Britain held dominion over. It was families like this that made Britain the proud country it was and still is today. It's to Burrish Lions, and I'll let you read the memorial tablet yourselves. The sailing vessel Mary was caught in a fierce gale in Cullen Bay, driven onto the rocks and the scar rose. Everyone on board perished. It is recorded that no body was found entire. It's a sad story. When Burrish Lyons was found, he had the arms of the cabin boy round his neck. He had obviously been trying to save him. We can just hear him say, jump on my back, we'll be all right. Burrish Lyons was easily recognised. We are told he was like Esau in the Bible. Now there we are told that Esau was an unhairy man. Burrish Lyons was known to be a Christian, so he was given a Christian burial in the church. But what of his crew? Nobody knew whether they were Christian or not. So their remains were buried outside the church graveyard. That's only 200 years ago. They were all remembered in a recent memorial service in the church, marking 200 years since the disaster of 1807 around and you can see the main door that we use today. You also see a blocked up doorway which I'll explain when we go inside. Higher up on this wall you can see another blocked up doorway. It's high up so there must have been an outside stairway there. There were at least three outside stairways. Now there is only one in use. We'll see it later. I draw your attention to these three wall plaques, 16th century plaques to the Ogilvies. That is the family name of the Seafields. It is now Ogilvy Grant, for the Ogilvies married into the Grants of Strathspey. Can you see AO at the top of this plaque? It's got the Ogilvy coat of arms and the motto in French Toujours, 
What does that translate as? Of course, it translates as always. The next plaque has E.G. That's Elizabeth Gordon, Alexander Ogilvie's second wife, her coat of arms, and the Gordon motto, Latin this time, Laus Deo, Praise God. The third one is I.O. Now there is no J in Latin, so it is really J.O. It's either James Ogilvie, the natural son, or John Ogilvie. There were two sons, the natural son, James, and an adopted son, John Gordon, who took the name Ogilvie. We think that is the heritage group, that it is John Ogilvie because of the coat of arms. We look at this part of the building, which we know as St Anne's. Notice the blocked up doorway I referred to earlier. This part of the church was originally a separate chapel with an entrance through this window. Can you see where the door would have been? This chapel was dedicate, dedicated to Anna, the mother of Mary. Now nowhere in the Bible are we told that Mary's mother was called Anna. It's an invention, a Roman Catholic invention. Look towards the top of the gable and again we see all that remains of a statue, this time the pedestal. The statue would have been that of Anna and again taken down and destroyed by the reformers. Come closer and I shall show you what appears to be little scratches on these stones. These are mason's marks, which are the signatures of the various stonemasons who worked in this part of the church. There are some different, there are some 20 different mason's marks to be found. All over the chapel can be found Latin inscription, Latin, Latin inscriptions. Here's one, Memento Mori, which translate, Remember you have to die. Why I have stopped here is to show you this window with the rounded arch. This, believe it or not, was the original doorway into the church and historians date it to the 13th century. Let's look at a typical gravestone with a skull and crossbones on it. When I show children around here, they immediately say, Mr Finlay, there must be a pirate buried here. And another child will shout, there's a pirate buried here as well. The skull and crossbones. These are in most of the gravestones, along with other signs of our mortality. The sand glass, the empty sand glass, the coffin, the grave stiggers tools, the bell which was rung when someone died, and so on. For here, look at this plaque, which has been inserted into the wall. What do we see? A skeleton. Well, we can all see the skeleton, but can you make out this figure? It's well worn, but it is an angel blowing a trumpet. And out of the trumpet is coming words written, in Latin of course, and now badly weathered. But the words say, Rise ye dead, and come to judgment. It's the last trump. Have you been a good boy, John? You've tried? Well, the next slide says, Take heed, you who live. I think we should move on quickly. Turn around and we find ourselves looking at the west end, the oldest part of the church. Above the west door is the bell tower, which is currently undergoing costly renovation. The bell is a replacement one, donated in 1860 by Mr William G. Bryson, who was factor of Seafield Estates at that time. 
To the right is the last remaining outside stone stairway. It leads to the two galleries, the Fisherman's Gallery and the Portnocky Gallery. These galleries are locally known as lofts, or the true Scots word is, of course, lofts. I will say more about them eh, and later on. I have two more features to show you outside, both on the north wall of the kirk. Built as late as, the 19, as 1967. But what I want to show you here are these stones. Today you came by car, but long ago you would have come by horse. Unless you were very fit, or your name was John Wayne, you might have had difficulty in getting onto your horse. You would use these stone steps to help you mount your horse. We call it a louping stain, a stone which helps you loup onto your horse and off home you ride for your mince and tatties. The last thing I want to show you outside is this gravestone. The date on it is 1603. It is the oldest memorial stone in the churchyard, although many people would have been buried in the churchyard before 1603. People simply did not have the money to erect gravestones. This gravestone commemorates two well-known families, Abercrombie and Innes. The boar's heads are representative of the Abercrombie family, where the crescent moon and the three mullets, or stars, are the Innes's. Let's look a little more at our building from the inside. We know it was here in 1236. Over here in the west wing is the original door, now a window. Architectural historians date the style to the period 1180 to 1280. That fits in very well with our date of 1236. That is when we know there was correspondence between the Bishop of Aberdeen and the Bishop of Murray as to whose jurisdiction this chapel came under. It came under the jurisdiction of Aberdeen. So at that time, the building was a simple rectangular building, stretching from the west wall to that change in the ceiling you see about two-thirds of the way down. The first extension was this south wing, which we know as St Anne's Isle. You will remember this part of the building from outside. It was built between the years 1536 and 1539. It was built by a lady who was always known as the pious Helen Hay. About ten years later, that man whom I refer to outside and whose monument that is at the far end, Alexander Ogilvie, extended the church to its present length and donated a lot of money to the church. The north wing was added in the years 1797 to 1799. It was built ostensibly to accommodate the people from Portnocky. You will probably know that Portnocky had been founded by fishermen from Cullen looking for a deep water harbour. The harbour at Cullen is tidal. There was no church in Portnocky, so the people who settled there had to walk across to the links to their church in Cullen. They often arrived to find there was no room for them. That is why this wing, which is referred to as the Portnocky Wing, was built. The gallery, or loft, was also added and joined up with the existing adjacent gallery, which is where the fishermen tended to sit. So it is called the Fisherman's Loft. The Portnocky Loft is also whimsically known as the Believer's Loft. That needs a little explanation. The pulpit wasn't always where it is today. It was for a time opposite the Laird's Loft. It meant that the people in the Portnocky Loft 
could not see the minister, only hear him. You know the story in the Bible of the doubting Thomas, who would not believe in the risen Christ until he had seen him. Jesus said to him something like, Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen, but yet believe. So it was with, with, so it was with the people in the Putnoki loft. They did not see the minister, they only heard him, and yet they believed. Hence, the believer's loft. Adjacent to the believer's loft is the fisherman's loft. We are told that the beadle used to hate cleaning up the fisherman's loft after a service. For the fisherman did not like, did not like you, like did not like you often do, suck a pan drop. It's often said that the minister's service should only last as long as your pan drop. More than that, and the sermon is too long. But the fisherman instead liked to chew tobacco and would sometimes spit on the floor. You can see why the beadle didn't like cleaning up. Before we leave here, I must mention the memorial to the Reverend John Guthrie. Many of the current rem members remember him. I believe he died of prostate cancer in 1986. He was missing from his pulpit for a number of months and then one Sunday morning we were surprised to see him coming into his pulpit once again. He started by saying something like, I have preached many hundreds of sermons from this pulpit, but if I was asked which was my favourite sermon, I would like to be remembered for my sermon on the straining post. I hope you don't mind if I tell it again. And he told the following story. He was coming down the road from Cullen and he saw that the fence posts at the edge of the field were all different. Some leaning this way, some leaning that way. Yet all were doing a good job in keeping the sheep in the field and off the road because these posts were all held together by the wires attached to the straining post. And so he developed his sermon, equating the faced fence posts to the members of his congregation, all held together by faith, and to the immovable straining post. He died a few weeks after that, and the Kirk session decided to remember him with this plaque, illustrating his sermon. Forty-nine and a half years, our minister, John Tennyson Guthrie. I want to tell you, before we leave here, is the flags. These are the flags of the Cullen branch of the British Legion. A very few members were left in the 1970s, and it was decided to disband the branch. A debate arose as to what was to, to be done with their flags. They didn't want their flags to go to the nearest branch in Bucky, Bucky already had its flags beautifully set up in the British Legion there. The Cullen lads said that our flags may well end up in a broom cupboard in Bucky. So they asked John Guthrie if he would accept the flags into the safekeeping of the church. So the small company marched to church, their flags flying for the last time one Sunday morning, and the Reverend John Guthrie received them into the care of the church. Far better there than in a broom cupboard in Bucky. We are now going to move into St Anne's Isle, built between the years 1536 and 1539 by the pious Helen Hay. Notice above the four light window an inscription in Latin telling us about Helen Hay and asking us always to pray for her and her bairns. Above the alcove is another Latin inscription telling us about her grandfather. On the pillar is yet another Latin inscription, the beginning and the end of which have been erased. The sarcophagus and effigy 
when it moved in 1792 by the Earl of Fife to his mausoleum in the grounds of his local mansion, Duff House, near Banff. That would never have been allowed today, but permission was given by the Earl of Seafield, perhaps because his sister was married to the Earl of Fife. John Duff, whose effigy this is, is a genuine ancestor of the Earl of Fife, whose name is Duff. Notice the inscription on the sarcophagus. It reads, John Duff of Maldavit and Baldavi died, that's Obit, Obit, 2nd of July, 1404. Look more closely at the inscription and the date. It is clear that the date is by a different hand. The 1404 is a fraud. I'll explain later. This alcove was known to us in Cullen as the Empty Alcove. How was the effigy and sarcophagus returned to Cullen? In the 1960s, the Reverend John Guthrie realised that Duff House no longer belonged to the Duffs, so he petitioned that the sarcophagus and effigy be returned to their proper place in Cullen Church. This was granted, and so every Saturday for many months he and Mr Peter Hardy, the Cullen headmaster, went to Banff and tried to chip out these items. They made a little headway. It so happened that the Countess of Seafield had a London architect installing a statue of her mother and father in St Anne's Isle. He became interested in Mr Guthrie's project and he persuaded the Countess to send her estate's masons to take out the sarcophagus and effigy and return them to Cullen. In no time at all, they succeeded in removing and returning these objects to their rightful place. They also brought back that huge memorial stone, which had also been removed to Duff House. They could not get it into, they could not get it inside, so they propped it up against an outside wall, and there it remained until the CAC session decided as their Millennium Project to have it brought inside. Historic Scotland would not, allowed, would not allow it to be put back in its original place on the floor of St Anne's Isle, in front of the sarcophagus, so it had to be placed against this north wall. Why had the Earl of Fife altered the date to 1404? Why had he put the same writing and date on the large memorial stone, which wasn't even a memorial to his ancestor, but the historian Mr Cramond could prove it was a memorial to Alexander Innes, a local laird? Simply to extend his lineage. We believe the correct date to be 1539, not 1404. Look again at the writing on the pillar, two parts of which have been excised. The first missing part is simply pray for. But the last part was excised because we believe it contained the date 1539. This date was recorded by the minister of the time. The date had to be removed, or otherwise the Earl of Fife's fraud would not have survived. What's the saying? You take a long spin to sup with a fifer. Look at that beautiful mosaic behind the pulpit. It was created in 1960 by James Selby with the help of his pupils in Pitt and Weem. James Selby was an art master who had married a local girl and had a holiday home in the sea town. Before he put the mosaic there, there was an empty space with a lantern overhanging, and he suggested he could enhance that part of the wall, and enhance it he did. Some of the congregation did not like the idea. They thought it would be too bright 
too rem reminiscent of Roman Catholic days. So Mr Guthrie had it unveiled on a local holiday weekend so that few objectors would be present. I think it is a lovely work of art. The Christian symbols underneath are worth noting. They are the Greek letter A, Alpha, the beginning, O, Omega, the end, while the X is our CH and the letter P is our letter R. So it reads Christ, the beginning and the end. There is an organ with the 17th century ladles used today for the collection of offerings. The organ was presented by Hugh Thorburn Wilson, who came from Tochineal, and he rose to become governor of the Bank of Melbourne in Australia. He sent his wife and adopted daughter home to Scotland on holiday, and sadly their passenger ship, the SS Warata, foundered off the coast of South Africa and all aboard perished. Wilson gifted the organ to the church in memory of his wife and daughter. The plaque in the organ pipes tells us this, and the date, 1914. We now move into the East Isle, where there are several memorial plaques to various members of the Ogilvy family. The largest is in memory of the best known of the Ogilvies. James Ogilvy was the Lord Chancellor of Scotland at the time of the Union of Parliaments with England in 1707. When he signed the Act of Union, he said, there's the end of an all song. But it wasn't, was it? Because when Scotland got its devolved Parliament a few years ago, his words were quoted. It had not been the end of an all song. Whether you are a Unionist or a Scottish Nationalist, make no mistake, this man was a very powerful figure in his time, and he had a great influence on the politics, on the political development of Scotland. Interestingly, the Earl tried to overturn the Act of Union in the House of Lords when he realised that Scottish traders were not getting the deal they had been promised. He failed by only four proxy votes. We are now looking at the Laird's Loft across the aisle. Before the Ogilvies came to live in Cullen House, they inhabited Finletter Castle, about two miles along the coast to the east of Cullen. Scottish kings encouraged their nobles to build castles along the Scottish coast. They were there as a first line of defence against invaders from the sea, such as the Vikings. But by 1600, there was no threat from the sea. And anyway, you would not have liked to live in such a cold and drafty place as Finnetar Castle, which was also in need of a lot of maintenance. The Ogilvies looked for a better place in which to live, and they settled in Cullen and began to build Cullen House in March 1600. And here we have the Laird of the Time, Sir Walter Ogilvy, setting up his loft in the Kirk in 1602. In one of the roundels, you can see the entwined initials of Sir Walter Ogilvy and his wife, Lady Mary Douglas. There's his crest, his coat of arms, and there's his wife's coat of arms, the Douglas coat of arms, with the hearts. You all know how the Black Douglas, the great friend of Robert Bruce, tried to take Robert the Bruce's heart to Jerusalem. That's how the hearts came to be in the Douglas coat of arms. The loft is supported by four plain wooden pillars. Onto them have been stuck the ends of pews, originally from St Anne's Isle. Twelve of, the, of them have been retained and stuck on these wooden pillars of the Laird's Loft. There's none on the far side. I don't know where the rest are. Perhaps they were simply destroyed 
or they may be in some dusty corner of an, an antique shop. But isn't it good that these examples were retained? We can see that these would have come from the seats or desks, as they were called, owned by wealthy families. You can see one comes from the desk of the Abercrombies. You know that by the three boar's heads. There's initials on this one. And this one with the crescent moon and three stars belonged to the Innes family. Some designs are very old. Look at this bird. To do with the resurrection, no doubt. There is also the green man, a pagan sign of fertility, but now a sign of new life. Look at these. A snip, the door opens, lift up the seat, go in, and you are inside your private pew. This is a box pew. It is a special name, a pumpful. P-U-M-F-I-L. A pumpful is an old Scottish name for a box pew or a temporary sheep enclosure. They are hardly ever used now. They are but a curiosity. The only time they would be used would be if there is a big funeral and we are short of accommodation. Let's move further back and look at this impressive monument. It is the tomb of Alexander Ogilvy and refers to him and his wife Elizabeth Gordon. You will remember seeing their 16th century coat of arms on the wall outside. This is the man who extended the church to its present length in the 1550s. He put so much money into the church that he was principally responsible for creating it a collegiate church, that is a church with a college attached. He bequeathed the church so much money that the church could afford to have a provost we can equate that to a minister today, and six prebendaries, assistant ministers if you like, each of whom had his own altar, his own accommodation, and enough land to earn him a living. So a small church like this had seven altars. The main altar would have been below the window, and it would have been the prophet's one, but dotted around the church were six other altars, at which each prebendary said prayers for his patrons every morning, noon and night. Just think of the colour. Think of the processions in those Roman Catholic days. Compare that with the day when the church is used just one hour a week without any of the pomp, ceremony, or colour that would have prevailed in the 16th century when this was still a Roman Catholic Church. It is difficult to grasp what actually was happening in this little, ch this little church right in the middle of the old town of Cullen. I will jump forward a couple of hundred years. We are now in the 1740s and there's a rebel army in full retreat. What am I talking about? Of course, I'm talking about Prince Charlie and his Jacobites. The rebels were not welcomed by the Seafields, who were Hanoverian supporters. But Prince Charlie's soldiers stayed a few days in Cullen on their way to bloody defeat at Culloden. Before they left Cullen, we are told that they plundered Cullen House. After Prince Charlie's forces left Cullen, along came the Duke of Cumberland. He was welcomed by the Seafields and allowed to stable some of his horses inside this church. Remember, in those days there would have been no pews, only an earthen floor. If you wanted a seat and could not afford a desk, you had to bring your own stool. Cumberland's horses were tethered to these pentacles on this grand monument, and some were broken. Reverend John Guthrie used to invite visitors to try and discern 
which were the old 16th century ones and which were the 18th century replacements. He could tell. There's a bridge on the other side of Cullen House, which locals know today as Charlie's Briggy, Prince Charlie's Bridge. The story is that Prince Charlie's soldiers sharpened their swords on the parapets of that bridge before they moved off to Culloden. Beside Alexander Ogilvie's grand monument is this ombre or sacrament house, a relic of Roman Catholic days. You can clearly see where the hinges and the slot would have been. There would have been a red curtain over the door, inside which the priest would have kept the sacrament vessels. The altar would have been below the window, and there the priest would have conducted the communion services. Where our main entrance is would have been the piscina, there the priest would have washed the sacred vessels after administering the communion rites. Above the sacrament house can be seen two angels holding a monstrance and the Latin writing reads, He that eateth of my flesh and drinketh of my blood shall live for ever. It is surprising that the sacrament house, an R.C. feature, survived the Reformation, but the story is that for many years it had been hidden by the, one of the many monuments in the church. It was only when one of these monuments was moved during a reorganisation that the Ombre was revealed. And I must tell you a little more history. I told you that the houses in the old town were very poor and shabby. No wonder. Cullen was a very, very old town. The Romans knew of it. The Vikings knew of it. You have all heard of the Battle of the Bods, which was one of the last battles against the Vikings along our coast. The Vikings were defeated in the Battle of Bods in 961. The Scottish king Indulf was killed, as were the three leaders or kings of the Vikings. You know the three kings' rocks in Cullen Beach? It is said that under each rock is buried one of the Viking kings. If you believe that, you will believe anything. But it is a lovely story. King William the Lion in the 12th century created Cullen a royal borough. Cullen was not a rich place, it was anything but. It was a strategic place on the main route from Aberdeen to Inverness. Early Scottish kings, such as the Alexanders, came to Cullen, for it was a great hunting place, with the forest of Boyne on one side and the forest of Ingy on the other. They hunted deer, foxes, wild boars, wolves, and of course they came north, simply to show themselves to the people and remind them who was their king. One of the kings who came here and was not liked was Edward I of England, because he tried to subjugate the Scots. What did our history books call him? The Hammer of the Scots. It was his son, Edward II, who fought at Barragburn and was sent homeward. To think again. But Edward I burned Cullen in 1296 and again in 1303, as did the Marquis of Montrose in the 17th century. Mary, Queen of Scots, stopped at Cullen on her way to Finlater Castle in 1562. The last king to visit Cullen was Edward VII, and he too was impressed by this church. But the king with whom the church has the best known connection is Robert de Bruce. His wife, his second wife, Elizabeth de Burgh, died while staying in Cullen in October 1327. Being a queen, she had to be buried where all Scottish kings and queens of that time were buried, Dunfermline Abbey. A long way to go in 1327 to preserve a corpse. 
and so her interior is parties were removed and buried here in this church. Another document states that, less delicately, her bowels were erdit in this kirk. No plaque marks the spot, but we can guess where in her internal organs were buried near the altar of that day. Robert the Bruce granted an endowment to the chaplain at Cullen. Now let me read this. King Robert of Bruce, King of the Scotch, granted and gave in gift for ever five pounds of the money of the kingdom for the support of a chaplain in the parish church of the Blessed Mary of our borough of Cullen, always to pray for the salvation of the soul of his most serene princess, Queen Elizabeth, consort of the said King Robert. And that was ratified in 1543 and again in 1445 and added to by Mary Queen of Scots. That endowment survived the Reformation and it is still paid to the minister today. It is paid by the Murray Council and amounts to the huge sum of two pounds and ten pence a year. It was at one time paid out of the Cullen Common Good Fund. But isn't it great that it survived? As well as royalty, many fa famous people visited Cullen, to name a few. Robert Burns, the poet, John Wesley, the preacher, Samuel Johnson and his biographer James Boswell, it was Johnson who refused to eat his breakfast of fish, and it was he who caused the blinds of his carriage to be drawn, so that as he rode through Cullen, he would not have to look on the shabby main town or its inhabitants. The last thing I want to show you is the stained glass window, created by an Aberdeen artist, John MacDonald Aiken, a good painter at Noyles, a well-known watercolourist, but most famous for his work in stained glass. It is a four-light window, and he had to fit in only three figures, but see how clever he was in filling the fourth panel with the Roman soldier and his horse. The window was gifted to the church by the minister, the Reverend W. Robertson, in 1933, in memory of his mother and wife, who died while he was ministering in Cullen. That ends my talk, and I hope I have given you an insight into the fascinating history of this magnificent building, Cullen Al Kirk. Thank you.